Any other additions? Just that one. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Got a motion from Bruce and a second from Rick. Any other further discussions? Hearing none, all in favor signify by aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. And carried. Um, nothing underneath uh, 741 proud of or public. Anybody here for public comment? Nope. We'll move on to approve and correct the minutes from the November 21st, 2017 the regular school board meeting and the November 27th special school board meeting. It was in your packets. Move to approve those minutes from those two meetings. Second. We've got a motion from Cheryl and a second from Lou. Any other further discussions? Hearing none, all in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, and carried. Consent agenda. We just one underneath there. It's review and consider approval of hiring Amy Bast, secondary uh, administrative assistant, effective December 7th, 2017. Yeah, just be aware, um, the board, we are, we have two administrative assistants at the high school level. We are moving one into our Mars coordinator, so Cassandra's going to move to that position, and we're going to put the new person in where Cassandra was. Oh, okay. The same, same unit, everything else, so there is no difference, but just to be aware of it. And this is just to replace a position that we've been short. Right. Do we have a lot of applicants for that position, or? Uh, we had a number. Of, they, yeah. they, we interviewed for the position. Okay. Uh, I think part of it was they interviewed, and um, Cassandra also interviewed for that piece. So okay. she was just one of the interviewees. Uh, when they interviewed for it, they let people know that it's really one of two positions that mm -hmm. they would do it. If the other one was uh, filled in house, then they would hire for the other position, and that's what I believe ended up happening. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. We got a motion from Bruce and a second from Cheryl. Any other further discussions? Hearing none, and all in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, and carried. Move on to business. Number one, re uh, review truth and taxation information for taxable payable in 2018. This is our truth and taxation meeting. We have Steve here from PMA, okay. and he will be taking the board through a presentation. Should I have them turn maybe, or do you have? We already want to know in the past. We'll just, yep, we'll come that up would yeah, be the easiest way to go out there. And do you want me to use that mic? Uh, that mic right there, yes. <laughs> All right, well, um, board chair, board members, and superintendent Hood, audience members, I'm Steve Pumper with PMA Financial. Um, one of the requirements, this first slide here, for every school district in the state of Minnesota is to hold a truth and taxation hearing. Um, it does not need to be a separate um, meeting. It can be part of a board meeting, and that's what um, your, your district has elected to do. The, the state statute um, has three um, components of it that you're required or every school district is required to talk about the current year school budget, talk about the proposed tax levy um, that the board will be taking action at, on at this meeting, and the third component is that the public is must be allowed to comment before you take action on um, setting the levy for taxes payable in 2018. So the timeline, it's very convoluted and it's a uh, um, a lot of estimates go into um, producing the levy um, for every school district. So back in June, the district uh, provides data to the Minnesota Department of Education. In August, um, this board would have taken action to set the date and the location of the levy hearing so that everybody, when they received a truth and taxation, or they received their property tax statement, it said right on there that the district was gonna hold their truth and taxation meeting on December 5th here um, at six o'clock p.m. Um, September, the board took action on certifying a proposed levy. 
and that's, those are the numbers that are used on the property tax statements. Um, by now, everyone should have received the, um, those property tax statements, and of course, on the, your property tax statements, you're also getting your county taxes and your um, city taxes besides your school district taxes on that. And then in December, you're holding your public hearing and you're certifying your final tax levy. So now we'll talk about um, the budget. So for fiscal year 2018, uh, Painesville School District um, uses what's called a fund accounting system and that's required by the state of Minnesota. There's five funds that the um, Painesville School District uses, um, a general fund, a food service fund, a community service fund, a building construction fund, and a debt service fund. I provided asterisks by the three funds, the general fund, the community service fund, and the debt service funds. Those funds, I'll have a levy component to it, and we'll look at those you know, more in depth tonight. Um, if we want to just back up, I'm sorry about this. That's okay, just go back. I just want to mention, you know, food service is pretty self-explanatory. Um, community service fund, um, that actually has expanded a lot for districts across the state. So now it's not just, um, you know, some evening programs, but it's also for pre-K programs and preschool programs and after-school programs. Um, that's a really all-encompassing fund now. Um, building construction is self-explanatory, and the debt service fund um, is used to pay back any bonds or any debt that the district has encumbered um, over its lifetime. It's kind of like your mortgage fund, if you want to call it that. And then that brings us back to general fund. General fund is by far your largest fund. Um, that's what most people would associate when they, when they think about school districts. It's the fund that pays all your teachers, all your transportation, all your building and heating costs. Um, anything that goes into really educating your students is out of your general fund, including administration as well. So when we look at the 2018 budget, and this is what the board would have approved back in June, so last summer, um, you'll see that uh, um, revenues for the general fund, your largest fund, are ten million four hundred fifty-one thousand, and your expenses are ten million two hundred eighty-two thousand dollars. So you have a slight surplus, um, you know, uh, just under two hundred thousand dollars that the board approved in your general fund, which is called your operating fund. Um, you have a slight surplus in the food service fund, a, a slight um, surplus in the community service fund. The only fund that seems a little bit out of whack um, on paper, if you, if you, without an explanation, is your construction fund. And the reason for that is right now you're showing $3,000 of revenue, which would really just be interest tied to the, to the bonds that you would have sold in the past and you have $510,000 worth of expenses. And the reason for that is um, that's not unusual at all for any school district. When you bond for money, you receive all that money in one fiscal year. And so that money out is recognized in one year, um, but you pay your expenses. Your construction usually is not done in the same year. It's done over a period of two or three years. So since you've already recognized all the revenue in a previous fiscal year, other than the small amount of interest right there, um, your expenses will always exceed your revenues and yours when you don't receive your um, bond money. Then your debt service fund is just a slightly uh, out of balance uh, based on expenses and revenues and that has to do really more with how much tax money you've collected in the past. And if you've over collected, um, then the state requires you to give some money back and that's certainly what's happened in this year. So that's kind of a summary of the five funds. Um, then we look at um, well, where does that um, revenue go I mentioned to you before, so the big piece of the pie there, the general mm -hmm. fund, 83% of all your revenue is going that. And again, that's what I think most people think about when they think of a school district. Again, it's going to educating your students, 83%. Your next biggest piece is your debt service fund, and that's what's paying back the bonds that you sold in the past to do construction for building improvements. Um, your food service funds and community service funds each represent 5%, and your construction fund, because the revenue was only $3,000, doesn't even represent um, a percent at all. Then when we look um, where does the money go um, source wise or where do you get that money from? So across all the funds 70 percent of your money is coming from the state. So that's in the form of you know sales tax and um, other tax you know the income tax that people pay to the state um, then, then they turn around and fund schools with that. Um, for the Painesville School District, you collect 18% um, of all your revenue from your local taxpayers. You get an additional 4% from the federal government, and then your kind of your catch-all category um, accounts for 8%. And that can include things like your um, 
the majority of your money for your food service program is going to come in, in the other category from when people pay for their lunch lunches or their breakfasts. Um, your community ed um, fees, that's going to come through your other. Your, um, you have a basketball game tonight, so the, the money that you're collecting for your basketball admission falls under the other category as well. Are these percentages pretty much um, relative to all of the districts? Um, no, um, that's a good question. And if you go back a little bit, um, <clears throat> the percentages on federal aid will vary. Um, you know, that's going to be from 3 to 8%, I would say, amongst most districts. Um, but the one that really varies will be your property taxes versus state aid. Now, almost every district in the state, if not all of them, um, is still going to be heavily favored in, as far as getting more money from the state than from local. But there are a lot of districts um, who have significant operating levies, you know, a dollar per pupil. And in those districts, you know, let's say they have a thousand dollars per pupil operating um, levy that they've gone out to the voters, their their amount of money that they're collecting from their property taxes is going to be a bigger percentage than it is here in Painesville. Also, those districts that have issued a lot of bonds because they've built a lot of schools lately or renovated a lot of schools lately, um, the majority of that money is coming from the local taxpayers too. So that would make that percentage higher. So there is a significant variance between the amount of state aid from a district and the amount of property taxes, um, depending on what's happening um, locally in that district. Um, however, this is funny because I'll tell you this, the expenditures by fund um, and, and as we talk about programs next, that's fairly consistent from district to district. So your district's going to be like almost any other Minnesota school district. 80% of all your money um, is going to your general fund, so to educating kids. 7% is going to your debt service fund. Um, your food service fund and community service fund represent 4 and 5%. Um, and then your construction fund represents uh, 4%. The one that's going to skew this for your district really will be um, any year that you have significant const construction expenditures. Because um, if you have a lot, that's just going to be a bigger piece of the pie then. Um, on the years when you finally have finished all your construction projects, then that's going to be a 0%. You know, that's going to weight the other averages a little bit higher. Example, next summer, we'll do a big roofing project. That percentage will be different. Well, it could be, except you're not planning on issuing bonds for the roofing no, project? Oh, no. It, yep, it, so that will be under the general yeah. fund. Yep, there are portions of your um, construction expenses um, that, like Bob just mentioned, like if you're going to repair a roof, and you're using that with what's called your normal operating capital funds, that's in that general fund expenditure, that 80%. The only expenditure that's in your construction fund is when the board is taking action to sell bonds. Um, and then those dollars are, are metered off to the construction fund. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we take a further look, um, and these are all codes that are issued by the state, so every district needs to report accordingly um, in these categories. Where, does, where do your expenses go within the programs? So the, again, the biggest piece of the pie here, that yellow section, um, is going to your regular instruction. It's called your elementary and secondary regular instruction. So 30% of your money is going directly to the classroom that way. Then if we kind of go from there and, and go around the clock, um, the state wants all districts to keep track separately for what they spend on vocational education. So 1% of your money is going there. So that's a classroom expenditure as well. And then the state wants everybody to account for special education separately as well. Um, and for your district, that's 14%. So if we add all those three categories up, 38, 48, so that's 52% of all your expenditures are going straight into the classroom. And that's either classroom teachers or classroom supplies. Um, community ed is taking up 5%. Instructional support services, and that could be um, things such as, as paras, um, that's 2%. Um, pupil support, I'm sorry, pupil support services would be pairs as well. Um, and that also accounts for your transportation expenditures. Sites and buildings, that's really um, your heat and your um, electricity, your plumbing, anything to be involved with uh, your maintenance workers, they'd fall underneath the sites and buildings. Um, your, your fiscal and fixed costs, that's your debt service. Administration represents 5%. Administration is what administration is, your principals and your superintendent. Um, and then your support services would be like your clerical staff and, and counselors, et cetera. Um, now we move over to the section that we're talking about um, the taxes that the board um, is expected to levy at tonight's meeting. Uh, and, we, and I told you there's three funds um, that you have a levy for. The first one is the general fund. And so what I've done here is I've categorized um, all the items that you're allowed to levy for in the general fund. 
and you'll notice um, the first column is what you um, actually levied for in 2017. Um, the second column over is what you're proposing to do tonight. Um, then the third column, of course, looks at the change, and then we also have a percentage there as well. We'll go into the major variances on another slide, um, but in summary on the general fund, um, it would go up by $54,722, or 4.14% um, over last year's general fund. The Community Service Fund is the second um, fund that you levy for. This one has a very slight change. Um, you'll notice that's in the early childhood family education that you're levying $2,009 less. In total, your levy for community ed education is $1,995 um, less than last year, so really insignificant. Um, but as percentage, it's still a negative 2.23% mm -hmm. because it's a fairly small fund. And then the last fund is your debt service fund. So again, this is um, the principal and interest that you owe um, for the next fiscal year on the debt that's outstanding for your school district. Um, normally speaking, unless you're, you're retiring some debt significantly, um, it's gonna be fairly constant, or if you added debt, it would go up. Um, so in your case, it's gonna be fairly constant. Um, you're uh, actually going up this year by $17,659, um, or 2.09%. I will highlight here, I, I don't think I have, I might have this on another slide, but I'll talk about it here. The biggest, the biggest increase here for you, um, year over year, is what's called the debt excess adjustment of $20,595. And I want the board members to understand this. Um, last year, um, you gave back to the taxpayers $44,886. This year, you're expecting to give back to the taxpayers $24,291. And, and the reason you do that is by state law, whatever um, debt that you have to pay in the next fiscal year, so the principal and interest, you not only have to levy that amount, but you have to levy 5% greater than that amount. And the state requires you to do that um, because they realize that in all districts, you don't collect all that money every year. Some people don't pay their taxes. And you people have to pay your taxes before you can actually get that money. And the state does not want any district not to be able to pay their debt service payment. So they say, okay, you're gonna to have to levy 5% extra so you have cash on hand to meet those obligations. But then we're always gonna look backwards a couple years and say, okay, if all those taxpayers did pay it and you, you over collected, then you have to give some of that money back. And so it's not like you're doing anything wrong by over collecting, you're mandated to over collect, um, but then there's always a calculation to say how much do you give back. So that's why you have a variance, um, you know, so for some year to year, so, you know, two years ago or last year, you were giving back 44000 This year, you're giving back 24000 So the net for you means that taxes are going up by $20,000 this year, even though you're, you know, it's just because of an adjustment. So then when we add everything all together, um, the, the change over all three funds um, equates to $70,386, or a 3.12% change. Now we we'll review some of those major changes that I itemized there. Um, there is a line item that's called student achievement. You're um, levying just under $12,000 less than last year, um, and that's because you're levying nothing for this year. And two years ago, the state said we we're gonna um, phase that out, and so last year they cut it in half, and this year they cut it um, to zero. So you're, you're not levying that amount at all. Long-term facility maintenance, I've talked to you for the last two years on this, so this will be my third year talking um, about it. This is a new program that districts across the state um, wanted the legislature to put in, and thankfully they did do it. This money is to be reserved for, um, as Bob like mentioned, roofs or um, parking lots or anything that you need to do on a capital basis that you're repairing and replacing. You can't add like new classrooms or anything with this, but if you have equipment that's going obsolete or like a boiler is not functioning anymore, you can use this money for that. When the legislature put this in three years ago, they said it's gonna be a three year phase in plan. We're going to, and it's on the board here, we're gonna allow districts to levy $193 per pupil um, for taxes payable in 2016. Last year they increased that to $292, and then this year is the last year of the three year program, so it's set at $380 per pupil. Now, current legislation has it staying at 380, you know, forever until they make another change. So, um, we're not expecting another increase, uh, increase next year. But you know, who knows what the legislature will do? But that's why your your dollar amount went up by fifty one thousand dollars because the the amount per child um, went up um, from two ninety two to three hundred eighty dollars. 
And then um, the last major um, change on that is your operating capital um, actually went down by um, almost $19,000. And it doesn't mean that you're actually collecting $19,000 less in revenue. Um, it means that um, the, the, the state has a formula of how much local taxpayers have to pay and how much the state will pay, that state aid and local taxpayer piece. And they, they actually help districts out by having what's called a higher equalization. So that means the state's gonna pay more of your capital dollars next year than, the, than they did the year before. And so that means you can collect less money from your local taxpayers and still get the same amount of money. And, the, and for the long-term facility maintenance, we also do get money from the state for that. It's yep. not all levy for our, our community. That's an important important piece with that. Yep. So if we were gonna get rid of some levy, that's not one I would suggest because we get money from the state for that. Um, so then when we kind of add them all up, um, we've got the operating capital I told you about. Uh, um, building lease actually went up by $10,000 year over year. Um, I talked about the debt excess adjustment of that $20,000. And then all the other adjustments, there's, they're smaller than $10,000 individually. Um, but as I mentioned in the very first slide about how, um, how long this process is and how many, how many estimates a district has to make, a lot of your levy is based on enrollment. How many kids do you think you're gonna have, not only this year, but the following year? And so um, the state then always looks backwards and said, well, okay, well, how many kids did you actually have? And then they make you make adjustments based on that from prior years. And so when you add all those together, that was $37,000 with adjustments. Some years that's a negative adjustment, some years it's a positive adjustment. It just depends how close you were to estimates when you, you know, originally submitted them. So when we get kind of down to the, the nuts and bolts here, your total levy is increasing by 3.12% in dollar amount. However, when we split all that the money that we're gonna collect amongst all the taxpayers, it's split under, underneath these two different um, um, market values. One's called the referendum market value, and that went up by 3.48%. So when we take all of the properties in the district um, and, and we equate what's called the referendum market value on those pieces of property, that went up by 3.48%. So we, people who are in this room who own houses here or have businesses here, you probably saw some market values on your properties go up or there have been um, new developments um, you know, that came into town as well or a combination of both. And the net tax capacity, similar to the referendum market value, increased by 4.9%. So what that means is, even though the taxes are in total are going up 3.12% uh, or the levy is, um, the individual taxes on a home will decrease because the pie just got bigger of who's paying for all these dollars. So if you have a $100,000 home last year and your home is still valued at $100,000 this year, so that's a big if, but you know, if your valuation didn't go up, your taxes actually would decrease this year by you know, just under $10, $9.97. And you can see the other um, dollars I've listed there as well. So why might that not happen? Well, your uh, tax, or sorry, the, the valuation on your piece of property could have gone up could have gone down and then you'll see a bigger decrease, but if it goes up, you're gonna, um, you won't see that same decrease. Um, and then the other piece I always like to make sure, especially if people are here at the, at the hearing with a property tax statement, they may say that my property taxes went up, you know, bigger this amount or they went down um, even more. And it's because we're only at this hearing talking about the school district portion of your taxes. And remember on your property tax statement, you have your city on there and you have your county taxes and you may have a special taxing district on there as well. But, but this presentation is focused strictly on the school district. Um, we always put this slide in just to help um, um, anybody in the community to know that there is property tax relief and, there, and you can go to the state, that's the website at the state to get the forms to um, you know, apply, you may qualify for that. So that's just kind of a reference for you. And then one last thing, just to make it a little more confusing, um, the district, um, and board members you may know, participate in what's called QCOM, so that's um, a, a way to, to fund some of your teacher's contracts. And you are entitled, um, when you add your QCOM um, into the levy component, to levy for a total of $2,408,505.55. So if any board member or any citizen went onto the state website today 
and they would look at the levy report for the Painesville School District, they would see that they actually, tonight at the board meeting, the board members could levy for that amount. You can't levy for any more than that, but you could levy for $2,408,000. Be, be, um, the reason that number is that number is because the state is saying that you are eligible to levy for $84,767.41 of QCOMP funding. However, the administration, I'm looking at the superintendent, is recommending to the school board, school board that you do not levy that $84,000 number for QCOMP, and instead you just accept the $157,000 of state aid. Um, for QCOMP. So the QCOMP, um, just a small education on this, and you may know this, it's broken um, into two different components. 65% of the money for QCOMP will come from the state, and 35% will come from the local taxpayers. This is one of the, as a matter of fact, this is the only item that I know that the boards can elect not to levy for the levy portion and still collect all the state aid. Normally speaking, um, if you decline to do your local portion, the state says, well, we aren't going to give you your money then either. QCOMP is, was different that way. It was set up differently so that um, districts could make a choice to collect 65% of the money from state aid and levy zero. And so the recommendation for this school um, district is to, to levy zero um, and still collect 157,000 of state aid. So therefore, simple math is we take the $2.4 million number that you are eligible to levy for. Um, the board would be under levy tonight as part of your motion, the 84 um, thousand seven hundred sixty seven dollars of coupon funding so that your total net levy that you would be approving at tonight's meeting is two million three hundred twenty three thousand seven hundred thirty eight dollars and fourteen cents and just to let you know I, maybe I put this out of order almost because the uh, all my numbers that I showed you previously of how much your levy is going up is taking this under levy into account already okay and, and one thing question that I get sometimes is, okay, well, what if we decided not to take any QCOMP money? Would that cause the state taxes to go down? I can promise you somebody else would get that money. Yeah. Because there are, is a waiting list for QCOMP right now because they can't afford it. So if we gave it up, there would be another district that, that would, would take, take it. it. Um, so then the final action would be on your on your board meeting tonight um, you need to survey sorry you need to uh, uh, approve a, a dollar specific levy and so I have that number up there in front of you so that would be your motion tonight to approve do we need to mention the under living or if we approve this knowing it's under levy yeah, that, I think that if the motion fine. is approving that amount you understand the intent of what you're under leveraging yeah. <clears throat> And then the next slide, I think, um, Bob, is just, uh, I'll turn it back over to the chair, chair then for public comments, because you need to have public, you know, at least the opportunity for public to see. Okay. information um, so I'll open it up for anybody in the public that has any questions or concerns about their taxes all right doesn't sound like there is anybody so everybody must be happy with their taxes <laughs> <laughs> or not, <Yeah>. or not. <laughs> okay so we'll move on to then two because we don't need a motion for anything on one so review and consider approval of the final 2017 payable 2018 levy certification and that would be for two million three hundred twenty three thousand seven hundred thirty eight dollars and fourteen cents that is correct so move I got a motion from Lou second second from Randy any other further discussions hearing none all in favor signify by aye Aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign, and carried. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yep, Thank you have a wonder. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll move on to number three. We're going to set a date for the January 2018 school board meeting. 
since that's it's come um, on up. We've been meeting. Everybody remembers that's our kind of opening meeting. We said a lot of things in that meeting. Uh, between now and that time, I will send you a packet that talks about the first meeting in, in January and all of that stuff. All of you have seen it now at least one time. Uh, the corresponding date, if we did it, because we typically we just have one meeting in January, would be for Tuesday, January 16th. And again, that's the meeting that we select the officers, uh, set meeting dates and times, just a, a number of different things. Okay, we got a motion from Lou to accept that date. I'll second it. And a second from Heidi. And at six o'clock? I was gonna just, gonna, I was trying to <laughs> think your names and say, oh, there was more to it. Is it at six o'clock still? Yes, in the, in the seminar rooms. Yeah. That's where we live. Okay, friendly amendment, six o'clock. Six o'clock on January 16th. Okay, so I got a motion from Lou and a second from Heidi. At six, right? Okay. <laughs> All in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, and carried. We're gonna move on to number four, um, a representative from the math department, uh, Mr. Spanier, will be uh, giving us an update and information concerning the technology using in the math class, right? Or just classes? Um, currently right now, just the math class. Okay. Uh, I will, I can make comments about what's happening in the elementary and the difference why it's math class and not other classes. I okay. I have it set up, hopefully working in Mr. Heiberman's room, if okay. you would like to. Okay, we're moving. Okay. What do we do about the, the video of our meetings? What? When, what, when we move, the video stops. Or are you able to bring that with us? No, um, I think we were not prepared to move it into the other room. Um, I, I can comment first, I mean, it's probably better. I can come back in here if you want to ask questions why don't we well there are a lot of people that watch it i'm just curious loud because the, just the mic. Oh, I can speak loud. <laughs> Trust me. All right, so this is a smart panel. This is the new and improved version of a smart board. Okay? This by itself is a computer, where that is not. That is hooked up to your computer, and you need a computer to run it and everything. This is its own computer, our internet. And so here's Google. I could do everything I wanted. I'm not hooked. The only thing I am is I'm plugged into power. So it's wireless capabilities and everything. The math department is using these, number one, because in math there's a lot of writing and interact, right? You're solving math problems, you're writing things down and interactive, okay? In the elementary school, Colin Wolf has gone from away from the smart board and gone to individual TVs. Like, you know, everywhere you go now there's TVs away. It's not interactive, 
but if you're not teaching math and doing it, you don't need it as much. Kids still have their Chromebooks, right? They're working in Chromebooks and stuff, but it's not really like a math class, and that's my opinion of it. Obviously, maybe in science or some other things, you would want a smart panel rather than just TVs. But those are the two options that you're probably gonna see is either A, a teacher deciding to go with a smart panel, if it's more of an interactive writing, showing thing. If it's not that, maybe like a history class or something where you're showing slides or whatever, you could just get away with TVs, okay? This smart panel then, what, what this does that a smart panel or a, a smart board does not do is everything I write on here is interactive on, this is my daughter's Chromebook right here. So she goes into her Google Classroom, which you've probably been hearing a lot about on the school board and stuff, and everything that I write on here, it's tough for you to see, but shows up on her Chromebook. Okay, so in a sense, I'm taking notes for them, almost. Uh, I still have a number of students that choose to do their own notes, um, I would still pause and, you know, the students would work through stuff before I work through stuff. But some of the stuff that they really don't have to write down, it's there for you. If uh, you're gone from school today, I have a number of kids that come back the next day and they've got their math assignment done or they know what it is and they've started it. Uh, maybe they have some questions because all of this is accessed from home. It shows up on there. So this is one of my lessons on uh, absolute value equations. I had already taught it and gone through. So if you're homesick, you can follow along with the lesson. You can do it at night and see my notes and things like that. Um, I've gotten much better at, or I should say the kids, I'm a big note-taking guy, and I made my 7th and 8th graders take notes, pencil and paper. I would provide copies, and they would fill it in in the last few years. And then as soon as they was done, they'd take that packet of notes and they'd shove it in their folder and they'd go to work and they wouldn't use it. Uh, and I always try, if you ask me a question, I'd say, take out your notes, let's look at this. I have more kids using notes now because of this. I mean, it's right here, and what kid can't do this right here? And I'm not gonna attempt to do it because my daughter has all sorts of things open on here, I don't wanna mess it up, but they can split screen it. So, because I don't, I have math books, I maybe handed out maybe 20 math books, but their math book is online as well. So they split screen it, half the screen is their math book, half the screen is their notes. So they can sit and work on a problem, and they have the notes right in front of them, the math book right in front of them, and they can see it. Uh, kids that are maybe, uh, not quite as good with their handwriting and stuff like that. Ooh, I wasn't very color coordinated this day. Usually I'm color coordinated. But if they're not very good at their handwriting, they're still maybe taking notes and trying. Sometimes we work that, all right, you try and take notes, and then you can use mine. Um, some kids, it's just up to you if you take notes or not. But they can read these notes. Their own handwriting, they can't read, you know, or it's a struggle to read. And so, here they've got notes to look back at. Parents maybe have notes to look back at to see. Um, this is an advanced math class, so I don't have a lot of extra stuff in it because they don't need as much. Um, it might take a little bit to load. I think I did uh, a different one. Oh, so this is kind of what, uh, when they open their Google Classroom, if you haven't seen, at least in the math portion of it, they can open it up, and I've already done, you know, here's Math 7. It's already in chapters. So a kid who's not very organized, boom, I open it up. I've got my chapters. And I hit Chapter 5. Now, kids have to go through and make chapters out of it, but Garrick has done a, a tech bite on it and how to do it, or folders. So here's Chapter 5. If I'm taking the test, I allow notes on a test, right? You've got to be able to look and research and stuff. If they're struggling with something, oh, this estimation stuff is killing me. I, I, what did he say about estimation? I click on the estimation part, and it's slow, but it's going to kick up the estimation part of it. And for those kids that struggle with organization and stuff like that, I found it's really helpful. Um, my advanced math class, I got more kids in there that take handwritten notes than they don't. 
you know, follow along with me so much. But on the other hand, it's nice because if I'm moving too fast for them, I don't have to wait. I, I still pause a little bit and let them catch up, but if, you know, it's that one, two people, I kind of go to the next slide and I just wait, and they can control their own slides. So I can be on slide two, they can stay on slide one and finish writing it down if I'm just kind of in that starting the new topic and stuff like that. They don't have to keep up with me. Or they can come back later at the end and fill in with what they missed and they don't, I don't have to wait for them as well. So here's uh, seventh grade, a little bit more estimation. So I've been trying to, and I didn't at the beginning of the year, I'm learning on this as well, but over here is your bookmarks. So I kind of learned that hmm, I can be more organized for them as well. So now I'm trying to write a few more things in here. So when a kid is coming in there and they want to find something, they open up the bookmark and say, oh, how to estimate. Okay, yeah, that's what I want to know. Or this is like the example he did in class. So estimation examples, I've got two slides of examples. And so they just flip and see the different types of examples and what we've done. And then again, for parents at home, if you're the type to kind of help your kid a little bit, if you can, it's nice to see what you've done in class and be able to read it a little bit as well. Okay, um, Jake, Jenica, and myself all use it differently. Um, Jake does a lot more uh, putting in different slides in. You notice this is his flash drive over here. Um, he has kids writing more stuff down on their Chromebooks. So you could make it so what I write up here doesn't get shared with them, but they can see the slide, and then they write their own notes on it with them. I have uh, all the eighth graders. The eighth graders don't have the interactive, the one this year. We decided not to go on that route. So my eighth graders don't have the capability to do that. And plus, from what I... It takes a little bit of a challenge, right? And some of those, you know, if you're, um, if you're not very good at writing, remember when you first had to sign your name on that charge pad, how you couldn't write very well on it. So uh, with time, they'll get better. But Jake does it that way. Jenica is similar. She loads like this, I believe. Uh, I haven't observed Jenica's classroom yet. Uh, she does not share the notes either, but she provides them with a copy on here again, and they can write and blank and fill in on their own. Um, Jake does a lot of his testing through this. So they can test, he can pop in daily quizzes, they can take it on here and write on their Chromebooks answers and stuff like that. I haven't done that yet. Um, it kind of depends on what you're teaching. Uh, I have basic algebra. So you got you know writing out equations and solving equations is probably ten times faster on a piece of paper than it is writing on a Chromebook. Uh, if you're doing short, you know maybe a geometry thing and looking, there's not a lot of writing to it. The Chromebook is nice. Um, so that's what I have. Questions? Todd, without the one-to-one -one initiative, it would not be as effective. From what I'm hearing, today. right. If it wasn't the, the reason why we tried probably three or four different programs, uh, we when we went to Belgrade, we looked up, and there's a there's a cost to everything, right? The stuff that works slick <coughs> costs money, okay? And so um, we tried to get how do we take this and share it with kids and do things um, without the one to one initiative. I mean, you might as well be on that because you're not trying to share. The reason why we want it is we want th this <coughs> to be here for the kids to use and to access. And like I said, pencil paper, they, they don't, who wants to use pencil paper anymore, right? Plus we were going through how many copies because I thought notes are useful. I have to teach kids to take and to use notes and stuff like that. And so now, like I say, I have more kids. Still not everybody has learned that, but I'll beat it into them sooner or later, right? Um, but if it's right here, they, they'll use it. You know? And then they see, hopefully they learn, ah, if I write things down or if I can look back at it, that's useful. And then all of a sudden they're in, you know, in your positions and your jobs and stuff and think, hey, I should write some of this down while I take notes and look back at it. 
And from my perspective, that's the importance of the, the technology levy that we have, that the community was willing to provide us. Right. And I think this is a great example of how we're using those dollars to make sure that it's coming back to the students. So. Right, yeah, if, if it was not for this, you know, we could be writing on a whiteboard or chalkboard or a smart notebook and it would. So this does have the capability to interact with this Chromebook. And like I say, we have three math teachers that we're all using it a little bit differently. Um, when we got time, we sit and talk together like, hey, what are you doing? What are you trying? But uh, I think this provides an opportunity for kids to go home and be able to spend the time trying to learn something that they maybe didn't get in class. <coughs> if they weren't able to do that, they'd be going home and not looking at their math, but be coming back lost. Right. You don't know how many conferences I sat through, and then when they're struggling, I'd say, well, did Johnny show you his notes? And we'd be halfway through the year, and the parent would be like, well, they get notes? And then i go to your, and then, this would be really helpful if you would have showed this to me, you know, at the beginning of the school year, you know? But having it here, and, you know, me doing it and stuff, and having it there for you, you know, like I say, I still might say, all right, you guys work out this problem, they work it out, then I do it up here, and they can see. Um, I used to, so I have up here the assignment and then the answers, and I've gotten good, so I have to hide it, because otherwise they come to class, they know what the assignment <laughs> is right away, and they're, well, who wants to listen to Mr. Spanier when I could just get my assignment done, right? I mean, he's great and all, but, so I, I cover that up, and I slide it down when they're done. When I'm done teaching the lesson, then, you know, if you're at home and you access it, you see what the math assignment is. And then, after we correct, then there's my answers. So tomorrow, I put my answers up there, I slide it down, and then with the smart board I always used to have, because I could only do one little slide at a time and they could only see what I did. And then I, at the end I'd have kids say, can you show me number five, what was number seven? You know, they all wanted to see a different problem because they got their paper back and they didn't know what was right, what was wrong. Well, they don't need this anymore, it's all right here. Once I uncover it and slide it around, they can look wherever they want on here and it doesn't affect what's up here. You know, so they can slide it up and they can look at number 29 on their own while I'm talking about number 13 with a student up here and they're not all, you know, because then they used to come up and hit the next because they wanted the next one and then, uh, and then, no, no, get it back there. And so now it's in their control and they can see the answers, they can look at it oh, this is what I did wrong, yep, I see what I did wrong now. And that's the idea of it is, you know, if you get something wrong, you gotta figure out why you got it wrong. Well, if you never get to see the right answer and it becomes frustrating, now they just look at it right there. Anything? Very cool, though. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Nice. Well, and there's lots of things we haven't figured out yet, but we're, we're working on it. Yeah, because this is the first year we've had these. Yes, we just got these, and we did not get them before this. We got them, like, the Friday before school started, so we got them probably the third, fourth day of school by the time it was up and running, and so we're learning as we go. And like I said, if you open up some of my beginning ones, I wasn't, I was making slides and different, but I wasn't labeling and figure out, oh, you can label, and then now oh, it makes more sense for the kids if I label them more, so if they're looking for something, they can find it. In some ways, this is almost becomes a flipped classroom, exactly. where the kids are able to go home right. and see the lesson right. and come back. So if I'm going to be gone, that's what I would do, is I would write that on, you know, I'd fill out the whole lesson and then they would look through it, read through it, work through it in class, then I would come back the next day and catch up. But they would have everything worked through and they could look at it. And that's what's happening when kids are gone, right? You're absent from school, you look at it, and you see, all right, and hopefully if you can figure it out, great, and maybe you figure out half the assignment, but at least you're coming back with an idea of what was covered in class yesterday, rather than coming back and having no clue what happened. This is cool, but are the, are the kids comprehending what you're teaching faster? Well, I hope that... Is, is that... Have you noticed that difference? 
I, I'm not teaching any different, I would say. I still go through, these are the same lessons that I've taught, you know, it's the same math book, it's the same lesson, the same examples for the most part. Um, my teaching hasn't, I still am up here and I go through everything with them and I talk about everything with them. Um, so I don't think my teaching has changed any. Their learning has, like say, the best part is I see it kids actually using resources that they never used before. Are they better at it than before? Every grade is different. I mean, without going into it, I've got some classes that are better than others. Even within a grade, I've got some classes that are really good at it, some classes that aren't. Some students that are really good that take off with it, some aren't. And that's just a learning process. I always say my eighth graders are better than my seventh graders because they've had me for a year, they know, and they're like, you know, before with that, and they know, notes, man, if I'm going to ask a question, I better be ready with something, you know. But as seventh graders, they're not as good as it when they're eighth graders, and it's a learning process. But I would still, so this is my percentage and estimating percentage. So I, this is what I taught last year. How do we do, we base everything off 10%, and we go through examples. And so, um, you know, we want to leave a 15% tip. Well, I find 10% of that, which is shifting the decimal point. So if it's $30, 10% would be three. 5% is half of that. And I'm going to leave a $4.50 tip. Minute, you know, better if she's cute. Maybe not if she's not. I probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Take that off. <laughs> okay. But, you know, I'm dealing with junior high kids. you got to entertain a little bit. Or you're 30% off at Kohl's, right? This is the same stuff that I've been teaching. I still go through it. I still write it up here. The nice part is, if they aren't comprehending as much, they can look at it longer here. Whereas, if I'm going and I'm off to the next slide, or they're at home, and they can't write very well, they can't keep up very well, they can open it up and look at it and say, gosh, you know, and look at that again and say, did I get that or not, you know? Or maybe ask mom or dad or older brother or sister, you know, and they can look at that. Whereas before, only if you wrote it down and then you had to write it down correctly, you had to be able to keep up writing it down and all of those things. So I don't think we're there yet. I still think all the one-to-one -one initiatives, kids, still need to learn when to use the Chromebook and what to use it for appropriately. I still have today, all right, your Chromebook's done for the week. Here's a math book, because you're not using it right. Okay, that's, that's, they're kids, right? I sat in meetings and listened to Bob and pulled out my cell phone and, you know. I have no words <laughs> <to say. laughs> You know? I need to learn yet when what is appropriate, what's not. I mean, this Twitter thing, gosh, I just got Twitter and it's kind of neat, right? But I need to learn. Kids need to learn. But if we don't teach them and tell them and they're never exposed to it, you go off to college, man. College is freedom, right? I better learn. I sure hope I know now what I do. It's better to learn and fail in seventh grade than it is in ninth grade or senior in college. But yeah, we, we still have teaching to do. And, and we have to remember and keep this in mind too, this is our first year of this initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we have a long ways to go both for having our staff understand what they can do with it and having our students be aware of what you just said, how best to use it. And to steal a line from Garrick, our probably sixth grade, fifth grade, fourth graders are probably better at it than our seniors because they've had it coming up all the way through. You know, my kids have had Mr. Wolf and, and stuff Man, they're good. I when the one of the first weeks I had this, Raina, who's in fifth grade, Mr. Spots, but she asked me if, well, do you want me to do that for you? I'm like, what did you, you know, I didn't know what to do. My, my fifth grade daughter knew what to do, you know? And so there but you know, that doesn't mean our high school kids know what to do because a lot of this is new to them too. And as we continue to integrate the technology both into our elementary school, which in essence pushes our high school. Oh, right. We have to change. And that's been my thing for years is we can't, our computer lit classes cannot be the same as they were five years ago because our kids coming out of elementary school are so far beyond that. 
right? It wasn't too long ago in computer lit, they were learning how to type, right? A couple of years ago, they were still finger placement, how to type, you know, how to do all this. These kids are so far beyond that. And the kids coming up next year and the year after will be better than the year before, and we better keep up and change. If we stay the same with our technology, you know, shame on us. And again, it's one more plug for the technology, Libby. That has enabled us right. to do this, and how grateful we are to the community for giving us the chance to be able to do this. Right. We've had my daughter Tatum uh, has volunteered in some of the elementary classrooms. She did Spanish and stuff there. She is in Fargo, and she's doing after-school Spanish uh, teaching there. And she asked. You know, if they have Chromebooks, I bet they said, ah, here's paper and pencil, go to town. You know, they, were, they didn't have any technology to work with in an after-school program at all. And she says, it's for, you know, the kids have it, they know it at home, and so to come and sit in a classroom and say, here's pencil and a marker, and draw a nice picture or something, kids aren't going to do that anymore. That's not the real world anymore. back in cool thank you for bringing us to the new room <laughs> okay so we're gonna move on to informational reports we're going to start off with administrative meeting report with Robert Hewitt huh? uh, not too much you know we're not that far off from our last meeting this is a fairly quick turnover when we just have the one meeting later in, in November and then we have this one earlier in December. Um, so not a whole lot to report. Just be aware that the next facility meeting, we're looking at January 3rd, mm -hmm. 6 o'clock in the elementary school conference room for anybody that's interested. I did have a conversation with Yolanda Stroud. She's in the Office of, um, of Security Facilities and Logistics Services, Office of Management in the U.S. Department of Education. She's the person that I work with in regards to the Reserve Center. Uh, we had a pretty good conversation, didn't really answer anything, but I will tell the board that I am rewriting a new plan for this this group. Okay. So I'm hoping to rewrite that the whole thing in December, and she's going to expect it in January, and then she will look at that and then give me some answers, I think, to the questions that we have about what we can do with the with the um, property and the building and I did mention even tearing it down and I didn't hear and oh my you can't do that um, she said get the plan together kind of for what we have I think I will be eliciting some of you as I write that plan mm -hmm. to um, put my thoughts down to see if there's kind of an agreement in that I think before I send it I'll probably even bring it to the board and and just update the community on what I'm sending in. Uh, but it will be significantly different than what the other plan was. And what I don't know is what that will mean. I, I think in the end it's probably still gonna cost the district some dollars, but I'd like to reduce that even if I can get it down to 10%, that's still a, a good cost saving for us because right now for 20% it would cost us about $70,000 or so. 
And even if I can get them to go say, okay, well, that makes sense, 10%, that's still a good cost savings that we can use the money for something else. So just be aware, I'll keep you up to date on it, but I've got some work to do on what we're gonna do with that. Uh, during the next board meeting, you're going to be provided with just a little bit of information from Lori. Uh, I was going to bring the robotics group in to demonstrate, but they tell me they have to tear the robot apart now because they're building something else. So she's going to do some taping of the one that they've been working on, and we'll show that as during her informational report um, in the second meeting in December, and then we will invite the robotics group in at a different meeting when they've established another robot and they'll come in and give you a demonstration. All right, so be aware, I think that'll be fun. Uh, if you didn't go to the band concert last night, it was fantastic. Music department just continues to do outstanding work. Uh, my hat is off to them every time I see um, what they do and how our kids perform. Uh, and then just the last thing for you is just a reminder that the next board meeting is on December 19th, but it is at? One o'clock. One o'clock. Uh, and the students again will be coming in to talk to the board. All right. That's what I have now. Uh, I wanted to put one other plug in. The choir concert is next Monday at 7:30. At 7:30, so I would encourage all to come. You won't be disappointed. Never is. All right. Um, I'm going to give a little informational, and then I'll actually ask the two other board members that are on the superintendent uh, search committee. Uh, <clears throat> we, we met in November uh, 30th with um, Greg Vandell. It was um, Bob, myself, Cheryl, and Lou. And we kind of went through um, just the process on what we are going to be doing um, as, a, as a search group for the new superintendent. Um, some of the some of the things that we talked about is some ground rules who's going to be doing what and so on and so forth uh, one of the things that came out of there is um, one of the questions was what how much input or yeah input that bob will have through this whole process and the three of us we kind of came to the conclusion that if we can use him as a liaison person then then that's probably and he agreed that he, had, he would he would support that um, nothing more than that because this is is truly a community and staff and board decision on which direction that we need to go to but he will be definitely help us with some of the um, ground work or ground work um, on the like for the for example like the job description we're, uh, we're putting, putting that uh, together uh, posting together right yeah. now so I'm working with with Greg on that and yep. and then we're going to be putting a um, monkey survey uh, for the for the community and anybody else that wants to put in uh, information on what they uh, uh, will anticipate what this new superintendent is going to be um, all about what they're what they think that the next superintendent should be um, um, so that's going to be out there um, we're also going to I think the last when we were hiring Bob uh, we had um, three groups um, that were um, a community group we had a um, facility or staff uh, group and then we had the board um, this time around we're gonna have basically the same thing but we're gonna separate the staff and administration so we'll have a administration group a staff um, community and then the board so we thought that would probably give everybody enough latitude in their little groups to figure out what they would like to see and do um, it, it for, the, for the next superintendent. Um, the other thing that we talked about, um, as we start posting this, um, um, hopefully we'll have it, uh, some of the information ready to be posted in middle of December. Um, I'm thinking right now it'll be middle of December. As soon as I get done with just a few tweaks that are no longer accurate on the posting piece, mm -hmm. um, I'll be done with that. Hopefully tomorrow or the next day I'll sh shoot it out to Greg. He'll take a look at it and if he has any questions. The postings themselves are pretty general mm -hmm. and generic. Um, mm -hmm. From my position, I don't think anybody's going to look at it and say, well, I don't like that, so I'm not going to apply. I think once that comes out, then they will apply if they're interested in the position. 
Yeah, and we're basically going by what he is doing already today. You know, with the uh, absence of an actual true uh, business office manager. I mean, we have to you know word it that you know those people that are applying for it is going to know that that's not you know we don't have that in place as of right now. So just some of the things to making sure that everybody knows uh, what the job is entailed, what they're going to get themselves into before they apply. Um, one of the questions that he had for the group, but and so tonight I'm going to ask the group, um, once we start getting applications, does, he's going to go through a, a, the initial, just kind of briefly go through some of the applicants and he's going to kind of exclude some of the low-lying fruits that he, he thinks that are probably, wouldn't be a successful fit for us. Uh, we thought that would be probably good, but then there's going to be all these other ones. Um, we can go two directions. We can either have the committee that you guys, uh, you know, said we are going to do it, or do we want the entire board to go through all the um, applications? So, knowing that, you know, the the confidentiality for all those applicants, we cannot divulge anybody's. Uh, name or anything until at that process until you can get down to the finalists. So, what is it? The, what, what is it that the board like to do with that process? Either we can have the entire board go and limit or uh, narrow it down to the six candidates, or do you want the committee that you had put in place to go bring it down to that and then bring the six to the entire board for review? Well, I was in the citizen one last time, and Greg came to us and told us um, that we had a lot of candidates, but we could talk about anything. And we looked at a lot Did you? of okay. candidates, and when that was done, we narrowed the four down, and he totally instructed us. Same as the instructor group, and I don't know if any of you were in that, but... Um, and we would we do, saw, we we would do the, the same thing. thing. I think, and I don't... We, had, we narrowed it down, and then once we got to a, a few, then it came back. And when we selected them, that was the only time it became public. I, I, you know, I'm going to just interrupt just here a little bit. I'm, I'm feeling just a little uncomfortable that the board is going to make a decision right. on something that isn't on the agenda as making a decision. Yeah. Okay. It's so, just discussion. So I'm okay. just going to make a suggestion okay. that, Mark, that you bring forward your concerns because yep. it won't be posted until the middle of probably maybe just before the next board meeting. Right. Or maybe I'll wait till just, I'll talk to Greg about that tomorrow. Okay. But why don't we put this on the agenda okay. as a superintendent search discussion, mm -hmm. okay. and then I'll just feel a little bit more comfortable with okay. the, the board making a decision when it's an agenda item. Yeah. Okay. If that will be okay with the board. I think you have enough time okay. to make oh, that decision. Okay. We have other things to set okay. up. Okay. And, and it wouldn't close till mid-January either way, I'm assuming, right. with timeline. Right. So that was that was kind of the, the one of the biggest things is is who's going to narrow it down to you know a, a smaller number so that we can bring it on to the rest of the groups to take go through that process. So that's that's uh, was the was like I said one of the major major um, questions that he had as we move forward uh, with the search. Um, Ba or Lou and, and Cheryl, is there anything else? That well, I like the way Greg has got a timeline on everything. Mm -hmm. Everything is just set in order so we know what's going to happen, when it should happen. And, mm -hmm. and at the next meeting, um, my hope would be that we would have some things that you could share with the community is kind of how the timeline may go mm -hmm. with, with that too. And I'll, uh, that's one of those areas that mm -hmm. I'm working with Greg to make sure that the logistic piece is put in place. Yeah, it was just pretty much a planning session, yep. and um, Greg was very clear on how it had gone before and um, very open to our discussions on what was going on. Um, I think it's going to go well. Yeah, I do too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, I do too. Oh, you covered it well, really well, Mark. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'll put that on as a discussion item. Yep. With yep. in, in just a few things that will be discussed and stuff, but I think be prepared to maybe answer the question about who's going to do some of the looking right. at that. And if there's any uh, anything else, I'll try to put it in the addendum. Right. That might be a question if Mark asks it. And we were like when we were talking, it was 
whatever the board wants to do. Yeah. It doesn't make any difference. Um, and we could probably even have Greg if he wanted to come to that I'm meeting not, just sure. to just to kind of just to kind of go so through that process so, yeah. so that he so not that we are agreeing on going through you know 50 applicants or 60 applicants together you know that could be a big undertaking yeah. if it's all right us. with the board I'll work with yeah. Mark on on that on yeah. whether Greg's at the next meeting or not yeah. so I'll contact yeah. Greg and I'll okay. just work through the board sure sound, sound good if that's all right good. good okay all right so that was the meeting with Greg which went very well so um, is there any other board sharing stuff? So I have one thing. I gotta tell you, I absolutely enjoyed the presentation in that other room tonight. Um, and I enjoyed that you took the camera there so the public sees what's going on. One of the issues we have is we don't tell the public what's going on here. So you start talking about robotics. They're gonna take the robotics down and then we're gonna have some kind of presentation here on a video. Can we go to a room like that and just see it so nobody has to move anything? Wait and see how it does. Uh, the next meeting is going to be a video. Okay. okay so they'll see that. Uh, we also, I also have another presentation from the elementary at that meeting. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start to continue to see people come in and present things for the community. Yeah. But we'll what I thought was maybe we check with. Um, However, we as a board could do that move to another room so they don't take anything down and we get to see it work. I'll find I out. I actually thought it was fantastic. Yeah. I'll find out what they need. Yeah. Would it be hard? So we'll, we'll work on something. So if they, if they that all they need is in here, we'll do it in here. If they need a bigger space, then we'll set something up. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? All right. Motion to adjourn. All right. We got a motion from Lou. Second. Second from Heidi. <laughs> Any other further discussions? Thanks, Heidi. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, and carried. Boom. All right.